12, I'm 5 feet tall. My home name is Jacob Irvin Wordline. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. My best friend is Aaron Larson. My favorite, I don't really have a favorite song. My favorite game is Clue. My favorite thing to do most is watch football. My favorite sport is football. And my favorite TV show is a Cosby show. My, what I want to be when I grow up is a football player. My favorite hobby is collecting football cards. I don't have a favorite book, and my new Spanish escape. I'm finished. Jacob Irwin Wetterling was born on February 17, 1978. His parents, Patty and Jerry, had three other children, of which Jacob was the second oldest. The family lived in St. Joseph, Minnesota. The small city is located just an hour north of Minneapolis. In the 1980s, the population of St. Joseph was less than 3,000 people. The town had a reputation for being a quiet and safe place to live. Back then, a lot of residents didn't lock their doors at night, and even after dark, parents let their kids play outside. Crime in St. Joseph was so rare, the sheriff didn't even carry a gun. It seemed that this was the perfect place to raise a family. The Wetterlings lived on the outskirts of town. Their home was in a cul-de-sac on Kiwi Court. This is where Jacob Wetterling would grow up, just another kid in the neighborhood. In 1989, Jacob was 11 years old. He attended North Junior High School and was in the sixth grade. Those who knew Jacob say that he was an awesome kid, always kind and well-mannered. His two favorite snacks were peanut butter and guacamole. He would eat both whenever he could. Jacob also loved sports. He played hockey and never missed watching a Raiders game. Back in those days, Marcus Allen was the team's running back and this was by far Jacob's favorite player. When his parents got him a puppy, he named it Marcus and dressed him in a Raiders jersey. Aside from sports, Jacob also loved spending time with his family. He would often go fishing with his dad and loved hanging with his brother Trevor, who was one year younger. Jacob was especially close with his mom, Patty. Every single Mother's Day, he made sure to draw her a nice picture this was something she always looked forward to. Overall, Jacob was an average kid. He had his entire life ahead of him, and like any other 11-year-old, he didn't have a care in the world. October 22nd, 1989 fell on a Sunday. That morning, Jacob's dad took him fishing. As we mentioned before, this was one of Jacob's favorite activities, and according to Jerry, the two had a great time. That afternoon, they sat down to watch the Minnesota Vikings play the Detroit Lions. The Vikings would go on to win 20-7. This was Jacob's home team, so he was really excited. After the game, he and his dad decided to go to a local ice skating rink. Without a doubt, Jacob was having a blast that day. It had been non-stop fun since he woke up that morning, and as the evening approached, all seemed well. That night, Jerry and Patty had plans to attend a dinner party. They would be driving to Clearwater, Minnesota, about 22 minutes from their home. Their oldest daughter, Amy, was out with friends that night. This left Jacob, his brother Trevor, and Carmen, who was eight. Jerry and Patty left the house around 5 p.m. Jacob hung out with his brother Trevor and eventually invited his friend over, 11-year-old Aaron Larson. For the next couple hours, they watched scary movies and ate pizza. Just before 8.30, the boys made a phone call to Jerry and Patty. They asked if they could ride their bikes to a nearby store. At first, Patty said no. But the boys ended up speaking with Jerry, and after some begging and pleading, he said they could go. He told the boys to be extra careful and carry a flashlight. Carmen, who was eight at the time, was too young to go. So a neighbor named Rochelle Jerzak came over to babysit. She was 14 and lived next door. 
Jacob, Trevor, and Aaron hopped on their bikes and headed to the Tom Thumb convenience store. The store was located on Lancer Road, just one and a half miles from Kiwi Court. When the three got there, they decided to rent another movie to watch. After browsing for a few minutes, they picked the comedy Naked Gun. As they left the store and began pedaling back, they looked forward to a funny movie and more pizza. The route the boys took had them heading down 91st Avenue. The road was dark and completely empty. Any houses in that area set far off the main road. You could only access them via a long dirt driveway. But this was familiar territory to the boys. They'd been down this road several times. By now, it was 9 p.m. Jacob, Trevor, and Aaron laughed loudly as they raced their bikes down the road. As the boys approached their turn, a masked man appeared out of nowhere. He held the boys at gunpoint and told them to get off their bikes. According to Trevor and Aaron, he asked each of them how old they were. Trevor said he was 10, Aaron and Jacob both said 11. This is when the masked man told Trevor and Aaron to start running. He said that if either of them looked back, they would both be shot. Scared for their lives, both boys did as they were told. They took off running towards the driveway that led to the Wetterling house. When they finally got the courage to look behind them, they said that both Jacob and the masked man were gone. Aaron and Trevor made a beeline for the Wetterling house. When they got there, they frantically told Rochelle what had just happened. When she heard the boy's story, she called her dad Merlin. He was still home next door. Merlin would make the initial phone call to police. He also called Jerry and Patty. When they heard the news, they rushed back to St. Joseph immediately. By the time they made it home, Trevor and Aaron were being interviewed by police. At first, officers didn't believe the story the boys told. An abduction in St. Joseph was unheard of. They thought that Jacob might have run away. But the boys were adamant that Jacob had been kidnapped. They weren't changing their story. Officers began to realize this wasn't a joke. Within the next hour, a search was underway. Police felt that Jacob and his abductor could still be close. 35 officers searched the route between Kiwi Court and the Tom Thumb convenience store. A helicopter was also summoned for an aerial search. Officers found footprints and tire tracks near where Jacob had been taken. But after a night of searching, that was about all they had. As the days went on, the search effort grew larger and larger. By the end of that first week, police were searching up to 700 miles from the Wetterling home. They combed through every field and wooded area in that path. By this time, even the FBI had become involved. With their help, officials in at least five other states were now looking for Jacob as well. Even the citizens of St. Joseph got involved. They helped to hand out flyers with Jacob's picture. Residents also held prayer services and sent flowers to the Wetterling home. St. Joseph was a close-knit community. Parents felt this could have easily been one of their kids. That sense of safety they once felt was now gone. Like the Wetterlings, the town hoped for Jacob's safe return. Weeks would begin to pass. Despite a widespread search, Jacob was still missing. The media soon caught wind of the story. It wasn't long before the abduction became national news. Mari Povich broke the story on a current affair. After this, several other news outlets would cover it too. Jerry and Patty would sit for a number of interviews. They pleaded for the safe return of their son and urged the public to call in with tips. For the Wetterlings, Jacob's abduction was a devastating blow. Up to that point, they had been a normal, everyday family. As you could imagine, they never dreamed of being in this situation. The Wetterlings held on to hope that Jacob would one day come home. In one interview, Patty remarked that she sometimes looked out the window and expected him to come running up the driveway. That year, 
the Wetterlings would spend their first Christmas without Jacob. Even in his absence, the family filled his stocking with gifts. After months of searching with no results, investigators focused their attention elsewhere. Detectives felt that the culprit committed similar crimes in the past, so they began interviewing sex offenders that lived near St. Joseph. Dozens of these men were interrogated. A few of them were made to provide DNA samples, but police still had no hard evidence. Without that, there was nothing that could tie anyone to the crime. As a result, all of these men were released after questioning. For a while, detectives also pursued tips from the public. With the case being popular in the news, a lot of calls had come in. Some people reported seeing suspicious vehicles. Others claimed to have seen Jacob after his abduction. All of these tips were looked into, but still, nothing led to Jacob. Progress in the case began to slow, and pretty soon, the case turned cold altogether. Fifteen years would pass by. In 2004, detectives announced they had a suspect. They were looking at a man named Dan Rasser. Back in 1989, Rasser was a neighbor of the Wetterlings. His house sat at the end of the driveway where Jacob had been taken, and he was interviewed by detectives that night. Rasser reported that a vehicle entered and left his driveway between 9 and 10 p.m. This was around the time that Jacob had been taken. After years with no suspect, police had changed their theory about the events of that night. They now believed that the suspect escaped on foot, not in a vehicle. The quick getaway meant that this person must live close. And with that, the spotlight landed on Rasser. By 2004, Dan Rasser was a middle-aged school teacher. He had no criminal history, and by all accounts, was just a regular guy. He claimed that he had nothing to do with the crime and was shocked police considered him a suspect. Detectives were definitely turning up the heat. They were convinced they'd found their guy. Rasser's face was all over the news and he was made to sit through endless police interviews. Eventually, a search warrant was served on his property Rasser still lived in the same house, and police thought he may have buried Jacob in the yard. Large holes were dug up around the house, but nothing was found. Despite this, police felt Rasser had to be responsible. For years, he would remain in the crosshairs of detectives, but with no evidence, they could build no case. Another 11 years would pass. Finally, in 2015, there was a major break in the case. Police now had a new suspect. His name was Danny James Heinrich. Through DNA evidence, Heinrich had been linked to another Minnesota abduction. This one occurred nine months before Jacobs. Jared Sherrill was kidnapped near his home in Cold Spring, Minnesota, just 15 minutes from St. Joseph. Jared was sexually assaulted and eventually let go. At the time, DNA was lifted from Jared's clothes. When Jacob was abducted nine months later, Danny Heinrich was one of the first men interviewed by police. They had taken his DNA and released him after questioning. Fast forward to 2015, and that same sample linked him to the Jared Sherrill case. Meanwhile, detectives noticed similarities between Jacob's abduction and Jared Sherrill's. They now believed Heinrich was responsible for both crimes. Unfortunately, Heinrich could no longer be charged for Jared's abduction. By now, the statute of limitations had expired. Luckily, detectives were able to obtain a search warrant for Heinrich's home. When that search was conducted, police found tons of child pornography. This included a large collection of videos and photographs. With this, new charges were brought against Heinrich, and on October 28, 2015, he was arrested. Heinrich faced 25 child pornography charges. With no way out, he struck a deal with prosecutors. Heinrich admitted to the kidnapping and murder of Jacob Wetterling. He also agreed to lead detectives to the remains and provide details on the crime. In return, he would only face one child pornography charge. As for Jacob's murder, 
he wouldn't be charged at all. Needless to say, this left the Wetterling family crushed. After all these years, the man responsible for their grief would be let off rather easy. In the end, they decided to agree to the plea deal. At this point, the Wetterlings just wanted closure and a proper burial for Jacob. On September 1st, 2016, Danny Heinrich led investigators to the field where he buried Jacob. The location was near Painesville, Minnesota, about 30 minutes from the Wetterling home. Through dental records, police confirmed the remains were indeed Jacob Wetterling. During his trial, Heinrich spoke on the gruesome details of his crime. On the night of Jacob's abduction, Heinrich says he was randomly driving through St. Joseph. He spotted Jacob, Aaron, and Trevor as they rode their bikes to the store. Heinrich says that he parked his vehicle and waited for the boys to come back. When he saw them approaching, he waited just off the main road and jumped out as the boys were passing. After telling Trevor and Aaron to run, Heinrich claims that he handcuffed Jacob and put him in his car. As he drove up the road, he says that Jacob was crying and asking what he did wrong. From here, Heinrich headed towards Painesville. After driving for a while, he pulled off Highway 33 and parked the car. It was here that he molested Jacob. While the two were out there, Heinrich saw a patrol car in the distance. He says that this spooked him. He assumed the patrol car was there for him. In a moment of panic, he shot Jacob in the back. Following this, Jacob's body was buried right there off the highway. It would remain in this spot for one year. That's when Heinrich returned to the location. He dug up Jacob's body and buried him again just a few miles away. Years later, this is where police would find the remains. On November 21st, 2016, Danny James Heinrich was sentenced to 20 years in prison. For one count of child pornography, this was the maximum allowed. If he lives to be free again, Heinrich will be 73 years old at the time of his release. For the Wetterling family, this outcome was bittersweet. All these years, they imagined that Jacob might still be alive. To hear that his life met such a gruesome end was definitely heartbreaking. With so many years gone by, they find peace in the fact that some type of justice was served. As of today, Danny Heinrich is serving his sentence at a federal medical center in Massachusetts. He's scheduled for release in November of 2032. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you found this story interesting, click here to check out another case.